We've talked about motivation. Now we want to talk about emotion, that other important state that drives behavior. Some people believe that emotions that are most common to all humans, the ones that we all experience regardless of our culture, sort of the basic five, are happiness, sadness, anger, fear, and disgust. But there are obviously are many, many other sort of motivations, excuse me, emotions that we produce. And there's been an attempt by psychologists to sort of categorize how we understand emotion. For example, James Russell and his colleagues sort of classified emotions along two different dimensions. Valence, whether it's positive or negative, and arousal, whether it's low arousal or high arousal. For example, positive low arousal would be things like relaxed and happy, and positive high arousal will be elated and enthusiastic. And if it's negative valence, unpleasant and high arousal, fearful and angry. And if it's low arousal and negative, things like sluggish and sad. So one attempt to at least categorize what we mean by emotions by grouping them into two dimensions, positive and negative valence, and high or low arousal. Another attempt to do that was by Plutchik. He created his emotion wheel, which actually put emotional states opposite each other in this sort of wheel. For example, you could have sadness or you could have happiness. Sadness or joy, opposite of each other in one emotional state. Or you could have disgust and acceptance, another opposite state of emotion. You could have anger or fear, very different from each other, but again, along the same dimension. And you could have surprise, a lack of anticipation, or you could have anticipation. Again, a very strong emotional thing, which is opposite from each other. And then he did, what he did was he looked at the, the sort of differences between two that are next to each other and created other emotional states. For example, the, co the combination and interaction of sadness and disgust is remorse. Disgust and anger is contempt. Anticipation and anger is aggressiveness. Anticipation and joy is optimism. Acceptance and joy is love. Acceptance and fear is submission. And surprise and fear is awe. And surprise and sadness is disappointment. Again, this is just an attempt by Plutchik to categorize what we mean by emotional states, to make some sense about what they really mean along several dimensions. Now, emotion has three components. It has physiological effects, arousal, which is really the sympathetic nervous system. So when we get very emotional and aroused, things happen to us, like our hair stands up, and our heartbeat increases, and our pupils dilate. There are all kinds of physiological responses to high arousal. We have a behavioral effect, like we have some particular facial expression, like if I'm happy, I look like this, and if I'm sad, I look like this, really controlled by the muscles in our face. And we have cognitive effects. In other words, we have an interpretation of what this stimulus is, which is cognitive. And all three of these are important in understanding emotion. So what is the relationship between these three components? And what is the order of their occurrence? In fact, in theory of emotion, there's a huge debate about what comes first. The physiological response or the behavioral response. There are several theories of emotion. One is the James Lang theory, and let's describe that. The James Lang theory says when we actually have a stimulus in the environment that's going to produce an emotional state, it produces the autonomic arousal that we have, these autonomic sympathetic responses, and then that produces the conscious emotion, the feeling that we have about that stimulus. The problem with the James Lang theory, however, is that 
The autonomic arousal occurs with very different emotions. It occurs with extreme joy. It occurs with extreme fear. And how does that, given the fact that it, the arousal occurs with so many different emotional states, really produce the conscious emotion? By the way, uh, James Laird Lang was really William James, which some people believe is the father of modern psychology back at the turn of the century. The other theory is canon bar theory, and that says, no, James Lang was wrong. The stimulus in the environment that produces the emotional state causes subcortical brain activity, and we'll talk about that later, and then that simultaneously produces the conscious emotion and the autonomic arousal. So the emotion is not produced by the autonomic arousal. Both of these are produced by the stimulus creating activity in the subcortical brain, and that's really in the amygdala, which is the part of the brain which is controlled by, by uh, emotion. But that also is the Schachter-Singer theory that says the autonomic arousal produces a cognitive interpretation, and that cognitive interpretation is what really produces the emotional state. So let's go through their whole model. The stimulus in the environment that produces the emotion, like somebody walking in this door in front of me with a gun in their hand, that will produce an emotional state in me. That causes the amygdala to become active. That produces autonomic arousal. But then the, the actual emotion that I feel is produced by the autonomic arousal produce, causing a cognitive interpretation that produces the conscious emotion. The Schachter-Singer theory adds this cognition into the model. Now, Schachter and Singer actually did a study back in the early 60s where they injected subjects in their experiment with adrenaline. And you know adrenaline creates arousal. Half the subjects were informed about the effects of the drug. They were told what adrenaline would do. The others half were deceived. They simply said it might cause some shaking of the hands and a headache, you know, not telling them exactly what adrenaline would do. Half the informed and the uninformed subjects were exposed to either euphoria in a colleague, what they thought was another subject in a group of three, but actually it was a confederate of the experimenter. And that person, while they were sitting in a room waiting for the drug to have its effects, became either euphoric or became angry. I can't believe I'm doing this. I hate this. I'm going to tear this up. No, I'm going to survey. I'm going to... So they became angry or they became very euphoric. They would make spitballs and throw them across the room, make paper airplanes. They just walked around the room, became euphoric, which was the effect of the, more the effect of the drug. The interesting thing was, if you looked at how did the real subjects behave, the uninformed subjects tended to take on the uninformed subjects, the subjects that didn't know what the effect of the drug was, tended to take on the emotion of the confederate. In other words, produced either anger or produced either euphoria based on what that third person was doing that was the confederate of the experimenter. Now, another psychologist, Joseph Zalientz, actually thought there were two different tracks when they saw an emotional stimulus. There was a fast track that occurred by passing the cortex, by passing this cognitive interpretation, and there was a slow track, which literally takes 40 milliseconds or so longer by going through the cortex. So his theory was you have a stimulus in the environment. It produces, goes to the thalamus, which stimuli do from hearing and seeing. And it goes to the amygdala. And then the amygdala produces a response, fast track. And then we have the slow track which says the stimulus in the environment goes to the thalamus, and then it goes to both the sensory and the prefrontal cortex, cortices, then it goes to the amygdala, and the amygdala produces the emotional response. So there can be a slow track, and there can be a fast track. And so they really tried to combine together the various theories of emotion by saying there can be a cognitive interpretation, but there are certain stimuli that we'll react to very quickly. It doesn't really need an interpretation by the cortex.
Now, an interesting study was done by Whelan et al. and his colleagues, which shows that stimuli sometimes occur so, so fast that people cannot even tell you what they saw. It's called subliminal perception. For example, he would flash these eyes, these eyes, or these eyes, so fast that they couldn't really tell what they saw. But then if you measured from the amygdala, the fear eyes, the ones that look very fearful, produces amygdala stimulation while the other eyes do not. So here's a case where we can't even report what we saw, but it causes an emotional response in the amygdala. Thank you.